probably couldn't do that. Thanks to its awkward backbone and inflexibility, proline is not going to win a gymnastics Olympics gold medal, but it should win a gold medal for helping us hopefully get through this coronavirus pandemic. And of course, it should also get a gold medal to Jason McClellan and his lab who helped figure out how we could use proline to help stabilize the coronavirus spike protein in order to learn more about it and to make vaccines based on it. So I'm gonna explain this first in terms like just more general abstracty terms and then in more detailed terms. But basically you might have heard, you probably heard of the spike protein. It's the one that like juts off the membrane of the um, coronavirus, the SARS-2 coronavirus. So you have this like circular sphere virus and then sticking off of it are these little spike proteins. And what they do is they bind to receptors on the cell called ACE2 and then they help merge the virus with the cell so that the virus can then like put all its stuff into the cell and then the cell will make lots of virus and those viruses shoot out. But in order to do that, the, this protein has to undergo this dramatic shape shift. And so we call a shape shift a conformational change. So the spike protein is actually this like homo trimer. So a trimer is um, three homo same, so it has three copies of the same protein subunit. So that basically means there's like three identical protein chains are made and then those chains come together um, to form the functional thing. And so each individual chain we call a protomer and together they're a trimer. And I'm showing it kind of like this because it looks kind of like a broccoli like stalk thing. But what it actually has is it has these like two main parts. So there's the S2 part and then there's the S1 part. So the, the S2 part is this part that's like um, like deep hidden in the center kind of. And so things in the center of proteins are usually more hydrophobic. So they don't like the water or the water doesn't like them. And things on the outside are hydrophilic, the water likes them. Um, and so the spike protein has, and this I'm talking right now about like the ecto domain, so the part that's outside the cell. Then there's also a transmembrane domain going through the viral membrane. And then in this inside, there's a little like um, cytoplasmic um, domain that, um, we don't know that much about it, I don't think, because normally people just study the ectodomain and, or the, yeah. So basically, anyway, you have this, um, each of these protomers, it has these two main parts, S2, which is hidden in like the stalk of the broccoli, and then S1, which is the cap of the broccoli. And S2, it's actually kind of like this. So it has, it's kind of like folded back on itself, and it has these two like long helixy things and what happens is S1, so the broccoli head is like sitting on top of S2. And it's preventing this S2 from moving. And so this S2, what it's going to do is like hidden in the S2 is this thing called a fusion peptide, which is basically, it's a really hydrophobic part. Um, so hydrophobic, remember, doesn't like water, but it does like lipidy things. So lipids like a fat. And so like a membrane is made out of like is lipidy. So the fusion peptide wants to get into that lipid membrane. But the lipid membrane is like up here on the cell, like floating around here. So you have this, the stock, you have your, this cap. And on the cap are, is this like receptor binding domain. So it's gonna bind ACE2 and it can kind of go up and down and up and down and up and down. And when it's up, it can bind ACE2. And then what happens is this proteolytic activation. So basically the, a protease is a protein scissors. So when the spike protein binds S2, so you can see one of the receptor binding domains comes up and a protease like tempers 2 um, it can actually cleave off S2. So F2, S2 falls off. So now you've lost that cap, okay? And you have this fusion peptide, and now it's exposed to like the environment more. And so it's really unhappy. Remember, it's like surrounded by water. It wants to be surrounded by lipids. So when the, what this actually does is to, like your S2, it's kind of like clamped together, like held on, like this S1 is kind of like stabilizing it in this pre-fusion state. But then once that's off, then this is going to like shoot up and it undergoes just dramatic conformational change where you have all this stuff in S2 that was all folded up. Now it's going to be this like elongated thing. And so that, and that shooting out the fusion peptide into the membrane and then it's gonna fold back and pull the, um, the membranes together so that the viral, um, genetic information so the viral RNA and everything can go get into the cell. So, pre 
fusion, it's down like this, bind spike. Um, then the protease cuts off S1, S1 falls off, this shoots up. This shoots up, this pulls back, pew, stuff goes into the cell. So in order to prevent um, this from happening, what Jason McClellan and his lab did was really, really smart. And they knew about it from work that they had done on previous um, viruses. They knew that if you introduce prolines at the um, at this junction where the, like my elbow would be, so at this interface between like the CH and the HR1, um, so between like this orange and the yellow, so right now I'm just showing it elongated, but remember this is all bundled up inside. And so if you pr introduce a proline here, well, it actually introduce two prolines, then it prevents it from opening up. And the reason why is because proline has this really awkward um, backbone angle. And so backbone angle, what do I mean by that? So basically a protein is a long sequence of amino acids. So they're 20 common amino acids um, and they link up in these chains. And then these chain, they fold up into these functional proteins. But, so there's 20 common amino acids. They have these different side chains, which are kind of like charms hanging off of a charm bracelet. And so most of them are like hanging off a charm bracelet. But in the case of proline, what happens is instead of hanging off like one of these, proline, it actually like the side chain, so the part that sticks off, like curves around and goes back into the backbone. And this makes it really awkward to move because so peptide backbones, so, um, the, like the backbone of the protein, it's pretty, um, it's pretty restricted as is, like with any amino acid, because the bonds holding these um, amino acids together, these peptide bonds, they're um, really inflexible kind of, so they can only really rotate at these two locations because the strength of this peptide bond, um, it, it's only held if the things are in a plane. So you have like each amino acid is kind of like a plane and then these planes can kind of like shift like this. And then these angles, we have like psi and phi angles. And if we can represent, so the, we have restricted psi and phi angles. Um, and if you plot them out on the Ramachandran plot, um, you can kind of see areas where proteins, um, where the angles will usually be. And so you can see for like a general protein, it's kind of like, there's, there's certain hot spots where they like to be, um, but it's, there's more flexibility than if you look at a proline, like it's, it can only basically be in like two different, two different spots. So by using a proline, you're kind of stapling it, my elbow down in this position. So it can't open up. And if it can't open up, it can't get into that post fusion confirmation. And this is important when you're trying to study the protein, because if it's going, if it's like keeps like pre, preemptively like firing and getting into this post-fusion confirmation, then it's really hard to study it. It's really unstable. And so when they were working with like other viruses and stuff, if they were trying to study this protein, so like use cryo-electron microscopy, which is this imaging technique to try to get a look at it and stuff, they found a lot of it was in this post-fusion confirmation. Um, and they wanted to study the pre-fusion confirmation plus the pre-fusion confirmation when they introduced like the prolines and stuff, it expressed like way better. And then they were actually able to introduce even more prolines into different parts of the protein. So they introduced like four more to give you six. So they call it hexapro and it's even more stable and expresses better and stuff. And so that's kind of like, um, things are starting to use that to study the spike. And so what, the reason why we want to study like this pre-fusion confirmation, so in addition to just like stabilizing this so you can study it better, with the pre-fusion confirmation, that's actually the form that's going to bind ACE2, remember? So ACE2 is the cell surface receptor that it's going to bind to. And so what you want is you want that the, you have the pre-fusion confirmation, so not the post-fusion confirmation, because you want to be looking at like measuring like ACE2 binding and stuff, and also antibody binding. So neutralizing antibodies are antibodies that can prevent the protein, this virus from infecting cells. And so antibodies are these little proteins um, that your immune system makes, and they can specifically bind to portions of viral proteins or other things, but in this case, viral proteins. So if they bind in the spot where the ACE2 normally binds, they can block ACE2 from binding and block the virus from getting in. And we call these neutralizing antibodies. And so to order to study them, we want to look at the pre-fusion confirmation. So the prolines are a huge win for that.